Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Okay, welcome everybody to GDPR from the bridge. More directly, GDPR, what is it and how does it apply to my company? Uh, we're going to give it a couple minutes just to make sure um, everybody has time to sign in, and then we'll get started um, at about three after. Alrighty, looks like everybody's here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to GDPR from the Bridge. What is it and how does it apply to my company? We've got Frank Vukovitz, Strategic Partnerships Director for FastPath, and he's going to go over everything for us and answer questions at the end. Um, we are recording it, so we'll uh, make it available to you after we're done here today, and uh, hope you enjoy it. Without further ado, I'll pass it on to Frank and uh, let us know if you have any questions. Great, thanks James. And excited to spend a few minutes with everyone today to talk about what is a very pertinent topic, uh, GDPR. Hopefully you're already familiar with it and uh, attended today's webinar to learn more about it and see if it does indeed apply to your company. Uh, we're gonna spend some time today uh, reviewing the regulation itself, talking about some common myths and misconceptions about it, and then talking about a, a very high level plan to how companies uh, can address GDPR. A uh, little bit about myself before we get into the details. I've been uh, involved with uh, ERP and business software and audit and compliance for several years now. I uh, used to be a corporate internal auditor with GTE slash Verizon, and then also worked a lot in the business software uh, and ERP space uh, last 10 plus years. Uh, both implementing software, but also uh, helping uh, firms in the evaluation of solutions around security and audit compliance tools. I currently hold two audit certifications still, and I'm one of those crazy folks that, that likes large compliance projects and activities, and certainly GDPR is one that, that falls in that category. So with that, uh, before we do get into the details, uh, just a brief disclaimer, uh, if you've attended any GDPR uh, webinars or training courses or workshops, you've probably already seen this as well. Uh, but what we're reviewing today uh, is not meant to replace or provide specific advice or guidance to ensure compliance for you personally or for your company. Uh, today's information that is being provided is informational in nature. Uh, it does not replace the need to seek qualified counsel and, and advice when it comes to working on GDPR, and again, both for you personally and also for your company. Uh, it, it's a very important regulation. There's a lot of great companies out there that are uh, specifically providing services around it. And hopefully after today's webinar, uh, you have more information that will help uh, determine exactly what path you and your company should follow. So here's what we're gonna cover today. Uh, uh, again, we could talk for hours and hours, days and days uh, on GDPR. Uh, with 60 minutes here, we're gonna provide a nice overview, as I mentioned, uh, cover some key definitions review at a high level uh, how many companies are approaching the planning uh, for GDPR and what uh, tasks are required to get on the road to compliance. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the shared responsibility model. Uh, that is key to this as far as the responsibilities both uh, for companies and for their software providers or vendors. And then we'll have time at the end for questions. Uh, again, a lot of good content here. There's also a lot of great resources out there as well on the internet, lots of governing bodies uh, have developed white papers, uh, checklists, and the like. So uh, hopefully this is not your first time uh, delving into this world of GDPR. But if it is, uh, at the end of the 60 minutes, uh, pretty confident you'll have a nice background and overview uh, to help you, again, determine the impact it has on you personally and certainly um, on your company itself. So let's get into it. First off, just from a, a, 
pure definition perspective, uh, the regulation itself is quite long. Uh, perhaps if you're having trouble falling asleep at night, it might be a good document to download and, and have at your bedside. Uh, it is 11 chapters, 99 articles, 173 recitals, very, very long document. So um, from a high level though, uh, I found this one sentence and I think it describes GDPR pretty good at a high level. Uh, and I, without reading the details to you, it basically revolves around protecting the privacy rights of individuals, specifically uh, uh, that those pieces of data that identify you individually. Uh, think of it uh, from a data security perspective. In today's world, we talk a lot about uh, protecting companies' data. Well, there's lots and lots of pieces of information about you personally that you own, just like your company owns data and wants to protect it. Uh, GDPR uh, coming out of the EU is a regulation that's designed to protect your rights to your own personal data. Uh, it establishes guidelines uh, that are going to be followed around the globe as far as how you can manage and protect your own personal data and requiring individuals and companies then uh, to follow those guidelines no matter where your data resides, where it's sent, or where it's processed. And we'll talk a little bit more about the misconceptions uh, here in a second, but uh, it is important to note that uh, while this is a, a regulation that came out of the EU and it specifically applies to personal data of EU citizens, it does not have any geographic boundaries. So if your company happens to uh, process data, store data of a personal nature for citizens of the EU or EU data subjects as they're defining the regulation, uh, what we're going to talk about today does apply to your company regardless if you have operations in the EU, regardless if you're headquartered in the EU. So um, at a high level, though, it's about your personal, the personal data of EU data subjects and providing the right policies, procedures, and rights to that data uh, so the individual data subjects um, uh, have the right to their data and can ensure there's privacy around their data. All right, so let's, let's first start off with some common myths and misconceptions around GDPR. Um, lots of good information, again, out there and has been published about this the last couple of years as well. I just want to highlight a couple of them to sort of uh, round out the, the landscape here that everyone can relate to. Uh, first one there, GDPR does not apply to me or my company because we are based in the United States. Um, I sort of hinted at that answer to this one a second ago, but um, the answer to that is wrong. Um, it applies to uh, EU citizen data. So if you've collected personal data your company has from EU citizens, it applies. Uh, GDPR does not have any geographic boundaries when it comes to who the regulation can or cannot apply to. It's based around those EU citizens and their personal data. Second one there, I've heard a lot about this GDPR, but you know what, it's, it's really more about marketing. It, it's about uh, uh, who can be contacted and, and opting in, opting out to marketing. There's, there's a lot of chatter out there in the marketplace about that as well. Um, again, wrong. Um, Personal data uh, that is collected from EU citizens is used in lots and lots of places, including marketing, but not exclusively to marketing. So uh, any place where you might be collecting personal data of EU subjects uh, and how that data is used in your company uh, falls under the regulation. It's not just a marketing issue. And then a third one here, and I've heard this a lot as well. Um, you know what, GDPR, it's an IT issue, just like Y2K, it's a, a technology problem. Uh, the IT folks have to figure out how to, how to solve GDPR. It doesn't really involve a lot of other departments or, or parts of my company. Um, unfortunately, again, that one is wrong as well. And while certainly uh, there is a nice component to GDPR from an IT or technology perspective, um, it needs to be addressed and compliance needs to be addressed at the company-wide level and different places inside your company. It should be a company-wide exercise uh, with executive commitment to effectively address GDPR. We'll talk later about some of these concepts such as security or privacy by design and the like. Uh, gets into much more uh, places in your company besides just the, the technical or IT side of your business. Um, now the myth or conception, again, this is uh, some of the challenges out there in the marketplace is that GDPR is all about this concept of right to be forgotten or right to eraser where uh, an EU citizen can approach a company and say, uh, I no longer want you to keep my personal data. I want you to erase it or I want you to forget me. Um, 
while that is certainly a, a right that those folks have, um, that is not everything that GDPR is about. Um, uh, there's lots of privacy rights introduced to GDPR, including uh, the right to be forgotten, and we'll cover all those rights at a high level later today or, or later in this presentation, but uh, there is a misconception that GDPR is all about this right to be forgotten, and that's just one part of the regulation. Uh, GDPR is all about PII, uh, uh, personal identifiable information, um, and we already know how to handle PII. And again, for the folks here in the United States, uh, this is a common uh, misconception that's out there uh, around GDPR. Um, unfortunately, uh, the definition of personal data inside the regulation is much more broad, uh, much more verbose than traditional PII definitions here in the States. Uh, it extends beyond traditional PII, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. Uh, and there might be some areas that you probably have not thought about from a PII perspective. The regulation defines uh, both direct and indirectly that that does have, that is covered. So uh, it's definitely more than just a PII exercise. And even using the term PII is is, is misleading because the personal data definitions, if you will, uh, go go much beyond the traditional PII that folks in the United States are familiar with. Alrighty, so that's some common uh, myths and misconceptions about GDPR. Let's talk a little bit about some key definitions. And again, I mentioned how long the document is, the regulation. So um, there's lots and lots of uh, key terms that, that are defined in it. But at a high level, here's some of the really common ones. Uh, data processor and data collector. Uh, your company is going to fall, uh, or I should say data controller. Data processor, data controller. Your company is going to fall into one of those two categories, or in some cases, maybe both those categories. Uh, first off, the, the data processor. This would be the entity that actually uh, has the data, has the systems that the data is processing through. Uh, sounds pretty st straight and simple. If your company happens to uh, use software that, that resides out in the cloud, perhaps SAP, Oracle, uh, Microsoft, and you're using the cloud services they provide, and they are, quote, processing your data, uh, those large software vendors would fall into the category of data processors. However, uh, you yourself and your company defines how that data is to be used. Um, again, if we think about the ERP space, if you're running SAP, Oracle, NetSuite, uh, Intact, Microsoft Dynamics, um, you've taken that business software solution, you've modified it perhaps, you've defined business processes around how that solution is supposed to meet your business needs, uh, you are controlling uh, how that software is to be used to process that data. So the comp your company then would be a data controller. You're determining uh, the ins and outs of the data and how it is used. Um, in the case of the data processor, they're providing the facility where the data is, quote, processed, but only under the direction of the data controller. Now, uh, there is scenarios where uh, you also might be the processor of the data. Perhaps you don't use a, a third party to process your data, you, you run as you run your business software on premise. So in that case, uh, you're both controlling the data and processing data. But the key definitions here, and we'll talk more about this later, especially when it comes to the shared responsibility model. Uh, talked a little bit already about the personal data. This is both direct and indirect information about EU data subjects. Um, uh, the direct one, most people are, are very familiar with name, email, address. Uh, but there's also some indirect information we'll talk about here in a little bit that you may not have thought of, that if you piece that inf indirect information together, it could allow a third party to then figure out or identify who that individual is. And that's key with the personal data. It's, it's uh, If there's information available on a, a personal data nature that either allows you directly, indirectly to identify that EU data subject, then that that's defined as personal data. Um, Another thing that's important to understand with GDPR, uh, the fines related to it. And we'll talk later about this as far as still waiting to see come after May 25th and the deadline, exactly how these fines are levied. But uh, this regulation has some serious teeth to it. Uh, all indications are that's not going to change. Uh, the current uh, fines are up to 20 million euro. That's right, that's 20 million euro. Um, or 4% of an organization's annual global turnover which is revenue, whichever is higher. Uh, those are the fines for non-compliance with GDPR. So there's some serious teeth here uh, related to compliance. And then I, I talked briefly already about one of the definitions that a lot of folks talk about is the, 
the right to be forgotten or the uh, eraser, if you will. Um, you may hear people talk about how they're addressing that through the use of two specific terms. Um, and I always struggle to pronounce these, but anonymizing your data or data pseudonymization. Uh, anonymizing your data would be uh, taking those data fields or values that are defined as personal data and for each of those individual fields, anonymizing it so that you cannot de determine exactly for those fields who directly they are tied to. Again, trying to break that link that would allow you to identify the, the EU data subject. Uh, uh, think of maybe putting uh, uh, asterisks in the field uh, to blank something out, if you will. Uh, and then data pseudonymization is an exercise where, uh, similar to anonymizing, where you're trying to take the, the, data, the personal data fields and, and change them in a way so you can't draw a conclusion to who the, the data subject is. But pseudonymization actually follows algorithms and the like uh, that, that uh, if someone does have the, the algorithm, the key to unlock, they could then reverse that entry. So, but those are, are two terms you hear thrown around when it comes to the right to be forgotten. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, that in a little bit, but uh, these are some of the key definitions. Uh, data processor controller and personal data, are probably the biggest ones that, that are mentioned quite frequently when it comes to discussions around GDPR. Alrighty, so let's jump into then exactly, uh, very high level, just as to, to frame this for the rest of the presentation, I wanna briefly describe two different scenarios uh, that could occur at your company and, and how GDPR impacts them and everything else we then cover today. Uh, use them as a reference point perhaps to, to be thinking about uh, in your own company what, what you folks may need me doing. Uh, first off, uh, let's talk about a refrigerator manufacturer. Um, a company uh, manufactures refrigerators, they sell them, distribute them out to their network of dealers. Uh, those dealers uh, have many retail stores. Uh, lots of customers come into their stores and buy refrigerators. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes those refrigerators don't work like they're supposed to. So a uh, customer uh, may come in and, and buy a refrigerator, take it home, and after a month or two, it's not working correctly. Let's say the ice machine is broken and they contact the store where they purchased the refrigerator from. Now, let, let's say in a scenario, perhaps that refrigerator was a special order directly from the manufacturer. Um, and let's say uh, perhaps that this individual that bought the refrigerator uh, might be an EU citizen, but they're on temporary assignment. Uh, perhaps they're a consultant working on a large implementation project here in the States. Maybe it's for SAP or Oracle, uh, NetSuite, what, what have you. But they, they go and buy a refrigerator. And there's a problem with this refrigerator. So there's information that was collected from that customer name and address, probably email, uh, good chance phone number uh, about that individual is collected during the sales process. And when they contact the outlet they bought the refrigerator from and say, we have a problem, uh, they probably pull that customer up in their computer system and their uh, business software and talk to them on the phone and realize that they need to schedule a repair call. And that's pretty common. So uh, they schedule a repair call for that customer and, um, this retail outlet, or if it's working directly with the manufacturer even, probably has a third party that uh, does their uh, work in the field as far as service calls go. So they pass on uh, that customer's information to the third party that's gonna actually do the repair call. Uh, the service technician comes out to that uh, EU citizens, let's say it's a condo, he's renting, and looks at the refrigerator and said, yep, you know what, uh, the ice machine is broken, I'm gonna have to order some new parts to fix this. Um, very common, say, okay. Uh, so what does that repair person do? Well, they don't have the parts to fix it on their truck and they have to order them. They probably go out to their supply company that provides their spare parts for service calls and probably create an order to order those, those, those calls, the, those parts to fix the refrigerator. Um, well, guess what happens? They probably pass on uh, the account information for that service call. Again, the name, address, perhaps email, phone number, maybe it's home phone number and cell number perhaps, um, onto that, that, that's, that parts company that's gonna then provide the, the repair parts, uh, ship them back to the service company, who's then go, gonna go back out to the customer's location, fix the ice machine in the refrigerator and everything will be, be complete and the customer will be happy. Well, in that scenario I just described, you have customer data perhaps starting first, uh, with the order in the refrigerator at, at the retail outlet, or perhaps if it's ordered directly from the manufacturer's a special order, even going back to the manufacturer. 
Uh, that information has then been passed on to the repair company doing the service call, who further has passed on some of that information onto uh, a company that's going to be the parts provider uh, for the service call. Um, we now have EU subject data, personal data that sits in three specific places. From a GDPR perspective, uh, the responsibilities for compliance rely with each of those companies, but the overall responsibility lies first uh, with wherever the data was collected. So if uh, the retail outlet that sold the refrigerator collected the information and then passed on first to the repair company, uh, they still have primary responsibility, one, uh, to make sure they're protecting and, and compliance with GDPR, but two, to make sure anytime they pass the data on to a party they work with, in this case, the repair company, that they also are maintaining GDPR compliance processes as well. And then the same would apply to the repair company because they then pass that data on to the parts company uh, and it goes down the line. So what you see here is GDPR has lots and lots of tentacles. It can go very deep across the organizations rather quickly. So as we cover things here uh, next half an hour or so, be thinking about that scenario and how it, it might impact your company in areas you don't think about because it, it, it applies to not only your own company, but if you're passing data on to other companies as part of your business processes, your supply chain, uh, they need to be compliant as well. And then the second scenario, much shorter to describe, but certainly just as important, lots and lots of companies are finding challenges um, with compliance when it comes to collecting leads uh, prospect information at, at industry trade shows, at, at trade shows in general. Let's say you set up a booth at a global conference for, let's say, internal auditors. Uh, we, we were at one uh, a couple weeks ago. And there's there's auditors from around the world stopping by the booth to learn more about your product. Perhaps you scan someone's badge. Perhaps they drop a business card in a fishbowl to win a, win a prize. Whatever it might be, you could very well be collecting personal information name, address, phone number, what have you, of uh, EU citizens, uh, EU data subject, if you will. And your company needs to then have the right policies and procedures in place for the governor of that information. And right now, perhaps, uh, you might take that information stored in some, uh, maybe it's in a CRM or marketing system you have at your company, uh, and perhaps you generate marketing lists uh, to send emails out uh, to promote events to the individuals on that list. And perhaps that list gets passed around uh, from different inside different parts of your organization, different marketing groups, um, uh, what have you. Uh, GDPR is going to require you to treat that information differently going forward. Uh, first and foremost is uh, the opting in to communications from your company and the consent of those individuals, those EU data subjects, is going to need to be very, very specific. And you're going to need to tell them exactly what you're going to use their personal data for, why they, it was being collected, and they're going to have the right to opt in or opt out to that. It can't be as broad as, oh, uh, by providing my information to you, I understand that you may contact me for future marketing activities. That's too broad from a GDPR perspective. It's going to need to be specific to, in this scenario, you may follow up with me with specific information related to the trade show I attended. Um, may seem that that's just a, uh, just a slight change, but in reality, it could greatly impact how your marketing department works with those leads. And also, as you take that marketing information that's collected and pass it around your company for other uses, you have to be very, very careful that those uses are clearly uh, uh, aligned and congruent with what you told uh, the individual at the trade show you were going to use the information for. Um, that's going to be a challenge for a lot of companies because traditionally trade shows, uh, big funnel, collect and prospect or potential customer information. And then once the information gets into your systems, it probably gets passed around in lots of different places. Uh, that's not going to work anymore. So those are two scenarios, totally different uh, as, as far as where the data is coming from, but totally, diff totally the same as far as greatly impacted by GDPR and things you and your company will need to consider. So with those in mind, let's get into the details here and start talking about how you plan for it, what your company can do, what the shared responsibility model is about as well. So. From a planning perspective, I, I think I might have mentioned already, but uh, this is one project that has a firm deadline, and that deadline is not going to change. Uh, perhaps when you implemented your SAP or Oracle or Microsoft Dynamics or NetSuite ERP project, you had a deadline, but you know what? Like a lot of those large software projects, the deadline got pushed back, got extended, had scope creep, what have you. Um, with GDPR, 
there's a firm deadline. Uh, a lot of folks think, that, well, this is, we don't have much time to work on this. Well, in reality, uh, the GDPR regulation was approved by the EU a couple years ago, and they told everyone the deadline is going to be May 25th. You got a couple years to figure this out by 2018. Um, unfortunately, a lot of companies didn't start back then. So um, if you're not started working on this, um, time is now. Um, in fact, you're probably going to find it a little bit difficult to get everything done by the, by the 25th of May at this point. But I uh, would certainly uh, recommend you you take uh, put a plan together and start taking uh, some corrective action now. And if you're not done by that point in time, if you're working on it and can work through it based on when you might get audited, perhaps you could still be okay. Uh, so the first thing is just know the deadline. And then the, the next three are really basic steps that any company would follow to, to go down the road to put a plan in place to be GDPR compliant. The first is identifying where you might have EU citizen personal data in your company's systems and where it might be stored. And I say systems, let's not forget uh, perhaps people are generating marketing lists for email promotion and dumping that out of the ERP system into spreadsheets, which are then being dropped into Outlook, which is then being used for mail merge activities and send out marketing emails. Or maybe you're, you're, you're pulling personal information out of your system of EU citizens and providing that to a third party company that does your email marketing. Again, you need to identify where all that personal data resides, both inside and outside your company. And we'll talk more about that here in a second. And then uh, that's part of the, uh, the exercise, then just uh, accessing where your company is from a compliance status for really the entire regulation and not just identifying personal data, but uh, everything else that goes with the regulation as far as from a compliance perspective, uh, security by design, DPO, uh, uh, DPIA, which is information assessment, something like what we'll talk about a lot on that here in a second. And then once you've assessed your compliance status, the next big part of any plan would be address the gaps you might have and updating your business processes and procedures uh, to, to, to correct those gaps you have. And then finally, uh, having compliant, maintain compliance activities in once you have the gaps addressed. Keep in mind that when you get audited for GDPR, uh, like like any other audit you might go through, they're going to ask you to describe your business processes. They're going to map those against the regulation, and they're going to look for gaps. And if you've uh, maintained uh, compliance activities and evidence and documentation of that, once you performed your own project and your own your own uh, compliance status was achieved, uh, then it's going to be a lot easier to get through an audit that might take place. So um, those last four bullets. So those those are the high level parts of a project plan you're going to see. Uh, for a GDPR project. So let's talk a little bit now uh, specifically about what each of those might be. I, I talked to, oh, did I just skip one there? Yeah, no, where did my identify personal data? I had to identify personal data uh, slide I thought in there too, but uh, uh, briefly, once you identify the personal data, again, I talked about on the slide before about trying to find that data both inside and outside your organization, understanding where it's stored, who it might be passed to, and, and, and using tools and technology to identify it would be quite helpful. And also understanding how it might change. Again, it's, it's EU citizen personal data. So once you define what type of personal data your company collects and stores, you then also have to figure out how to identify what applies to EU citizens and what is not EU citizens data. Now, certainly for those folks that are not uh, based in the EU um, and other countries uh, that, that say, well, you know what, we're not based in the EU, our country, like the United States does not have a similar regulation for GDPR. Uh, there's a strong argument to be made that those regulations are coming for the United States and other parts of the world. And perhaps you should start handling and changing your procedures, not just to meet GDPR for EU citizen data citizens, but also for just any, any citizens data you might store uh, that uh, update your procedures now across the company, not just EU specific. But regardless, when you identify that personal data, then the next step is going through the regulation and assessing where your company might stand as far as being compliant with the requirements. Um, and here's, here's five bullets. Um, there's a lot more areas as well in the regulation that, than these five, but these are the larger areas where traditionally most folks are spending a lot of time and realizing they have some work to do when it comes to compliance. Uh, the first is consent. I talked about that briefly. Uh, when you do collect personal data, of EU data citizens, if you will, or data subjects, I should say, uh, do you have their consent? And in that consent process, what are you telling them specifically you're going to do with their data? And once you tell them that and they still opt in and consent to that, 
What processes do you have in place to ensure that data is only used for that purpose? Um, privacy rights, uh, assessing where you stand with the, the various rights that uh, EU citizens have to their data. And I have a slide on that here in a second. There's seven or eight different rights to their data where they can request to know how their data is used. They can request to, to know, they can request to have your, their data forgotten. They can request to know how their data is processed. Lots and lots of rights they have there and you have to determine where your company stands with the ability not only to respond to their request, but how you process or maintain their rights. The, the concept of security or privacy by design. Uh, this is something that will, will probably require a change in some cases to the overall methodology that your company uses in designing systems and setting up the right controls uh, uh, around security and privacy for not just the collection, but then the storing, storing of that data. Uh, the right to be forgotten, we talked about a little bit already. That's one of the privacy rights as far as if someone wants to have their data forgotten and you determine it's a valid request and does not impact any of your laws or regulations that would require you to still store their data. And the GDPR does specifically allow companies to uh, say no to some of those right to be forgotten requests if there's a valid regulation um, or law that would require you, you to still store those specific pieces of data personal data. Uh, that, that process, though, is how you do forget people, what tools you use, how you document that, how you test that, all that would be part of assessing your, your compliance status. And the last one, if, you're, uh, if you need to have a data protection officer to oversee all your GDPR activities. Now, some very, very small companies may say we don't have the ability, the resources to have a, a formal DPO. And again, until audits start to happen, we won't know how critical that is or is not from a audit perspective, but certainly most larger enterprise companies um, that are going down the road to GDPR compliance have defined a DPO. The role that uh, the data privacy officer is clearly, the protection officer is clearly defined in regulation, who they report to, what their responsibilities are, and for most large enterprise companies, it's a, it's a requirement. Uh, I think that if you don't have a DPO, you're going to find that it's going to be very difficult to get the right executive commitment, the right project oversight of a GDPR compliance project, and more importantly, the right focus from a going forward perspective when we talk about maintaining compliance activities because GDPR is not just a one-time exercise. So those are some, some areas that you would look at from a, assessing where your company might stand from a compliance perspective. And then once you do that, do that work, then you have to address the gaps. And again, many companies are addressing these gaps with their own resources, but many also are hiring outside firms that specialize in GDPR to assist them, and just like when you perhaps implemented your SAP, Oracle, NetSuite, Microsoft Dynamics business software solution, you had consultants that helped you with that exercise. Many companies are, are bringing consultants in to help them with GDPR and addressing their compliance gaps. Um, and providing recommendations of how to address the gaps identified. Uh, and then internally, companies are working to make sure there's the right changes made to your business processes, the right communications of why, and the right processes that are being put in place to maintain those new policies and procedures and, and changes to your business processes that are put in place for GDPR. Um, probably going to be a lot of updating of internal documentation uh, related to changes made uh, to GDPR. Probably not unlike what you did uh, when you implemented your business software the first time and you thoroughly documented your business processes in the new new world, if you would, or the, the, the new processes you were following with the support of your ERP system. Uh, and also, there's going to be a lot of work uh, external facing from updating the policies, uh, privacy statements, privacy guidelines, that fine print that people click through on your website, uh, fine print that might be at the bottom of contracts, fine print that might be uh, at the bottom of forms that people are filling out on your website. Uh, you're probably going to up, be updating a lot of that documentation as well. And then there's, there's a lot of information that makes sure your employees understand why GDPR ex impacts your company and the importance of it to your company. And, and so they have a knowledge of the regulation and how it impacts their day-to-day -day job and understand the commitment that your company has to, to GDPR compliance. And of course, once you address all these gaps, uh, you need to implement a process going forward to allow you to be compliant in the future. Again, as I mentioned earlier, GDPR is not a one-time exercise. It's something that's gonna be a part of your business processes going forward with the changes you make to ensure you can stay compliant uh, with the regulation. So speaking of staying maintaining compliance, uh, some ways you can go about doing this. Of course, obviously, going forward, testing your processes 
as it relates to GDPR. Uh, if your company is large enough and has an internal audit department, more than likely they're going to build into their internal audit plan on a yearly basis some testing, some audits around GDPR compliance, picking specific business areas, business processes to look at. Um, but you're also going to make sure, just in general, um, you, you have this culture of privacy by design, uh, this culture of, of protecting personal data. Uh, the, the ongoing maintenance and updating of, of your GDPR processes is one that's front and center, that when you're looking at new projects, uh, when you're evaluating and making changes to your uh, your technology, that someone's asking a question, what's the impact of this on GDPR? And that you, you have that front and center so that, again, when you make changes and update things that GDPR is considered. Uh, this private concept of privacy of design and how you handle that personal data should be a part of all future system requirements. Uh, perhaps you're upgrading to a new business software or ERP solution. Perhaps you're adding some new add-ons to go with your Oracle um, uh, EBS install when you're going to add some new supply ch chain management modules. Or with SAP, you're maybe moving SAP S4 HANA in the cloud and you're adding some, some solutions there. Maybe you're looking at added success factors or something else to your SAP uh, environment. Are you thinking about GDPR and are you keeping this concept of privacy by design front and center? And then that last bullet there is a big one, going back to a couple of those scenarios I talked about before, uh, making sure your vendor and third-party agreements address GDPR. I know here at FastPath, oh, in the last quarter, I've probably gotten eight to 10 uh, documents from different software vendors that uh, are different uh, partners we work with that are asking us and customers specifically to comment what we're doing related to GDPR uh, because they're realizing that they need to make sure all their third party agreements now address GDPR. If, if data is being passed back and forth from your company, personal data, again, of EU, of EU citizens, you better make sure the companies you're working with understand how they handle that data. Uh, you spend a lot of time and money to handle it correctly inside your own four walls, if you will, and maybe inside the, the cloud as well that you control. Uh, you need to make sure when it, that data is leaving your own control that the people you're passing it to uh, do the same. Uh, so updating agreements, uh, both the key vendors and third parties that you're passing uh, personal data to and from is, is critical from a compliance perspective as well. I have no doubt that that's going to be one of the areas the auditors will focus in on uh, because it's quite common for companies in general from an audit perspective to worry and spend a lot of time making sure they uh, have the right controls in place in their own environment but sometimes um, not having as much control about their key business partners, they don't spend as much time communicating and making sure they're in compliance as well. And yet sometimes uh, when they're sharing processes, passing data back and forth, uh, um, you can have just as many problems with your key strategic partners as you can in your own environment. So um, maintaining those, those third party agreements, updating them, communicating with your vendors about GDPR or something hopefully uh, that your company will build into your processes uh, from a compliance perspective. All right. Well, building upon that theory or that the concept of, of key key vendors and third party suppliers, I want to wrap up sort of talking about uh, how you might address compliance with this idea of the shared responsibility model. Uh, SAP, Oracle, Microsoft Dynamics, NetSuite, Intac, Acumatica, all these software vendors out there um, all have information on their websites about GDPR. Uh, some have very, very detailed websites about compliance tools they have and what they as a company are doing around GDPR. Others don't have quite as many details, but all of them realize importance and they have to address it. Um, they spend a lot of time talking about what they do and do not control. And this is where the shared responsibility model uh, comes into play. And this is a common term. Uh, if you would Bing or Google any of these software vendors and then the term shared responsibility model, you're going to find statements from them uh, to begin with about who's responsible for what when they uh, are working with you as a customer from a data perspective, separate from GDPR, but it applies to GDPR. So uh, my scenario and definitions, I talked about the data processors at the beginning of today's webinar. Let's say you're uh, running S4 HANA in the cloud, or you're running Dynamics 365 for Microsoft in the cloud, or you're running NetSuite, which obviously is in the cloud, or Acumatic and Tax in the cloud. Let's say you're running Oracle Cloud Financials. Uh, those software vendors are processing your data. Uh, they have responsibilities. It sits inside their cloud data centers. Uh, they provide the physical security controls, a lot of the logical security controls, uh, 
Uh, there's lots of pieces of, of, of personal data that you as the controller have defined uh, how that data should be processed on their on their hardware, if you will. And as such, they have some responsibilities uh, to provide you as a customer, separate from GDPR, but it applies to GDPR, assurances that that data is safe, uh, assurances that that environment that data is in is housed from a physical perspective in a way that uh, nothing's going to happen to that data uh, and the like. So um, it's important to know that, that, that they have responsibilities, but you still, too, as the data controller, have responsibilities. Just because your data sits out in the cloud does not relieve you as a controller as still having responsibilities for defining how that personal data is used. You're still providing the instructions, and those instructions are carried out in the data processor's equipment. Uh, in some cases, and uh, Microsoft Office 365 is a prime example, um, it's a cloud. Microsoft Office 365 runs in the cloud. Uh, so in some cases, the processor and the controller are one and the same. Um, and again, I, I think in the scenario I talked about earlier as well, if you're running some of these ERP solutions on-premise, uh, where you actually are the processor and the controller as well. Uh, but th the key bullet point here is don't assume that your, your business software vendor is solely that of a data processor, and don't assume that they have sole responsibilities for having the right controls in place to meet your needs for GDPR compliance. All of them have done a really good job of communicating out and providing public statements about what they're doing related to GDPR. But similar to uh, SOX compliance here in the States, HIPAA regulations here in the States, uh, JSOX, other regulations around the globe, uh, there is no silver bullet to compliance. Uh, there's no just one piece of software or one software vendor that's going to ensure you compliance with GDPR as well. Um, GDPR compliance is a combination of people process and software and the shared responsibility model defines on the software side and the process side what the what the data processor does and what the data controller still has to do um, it's very very important that that you don't um, go out there and purchase a solution because it says quote they're gdpr compliant uh, their tool may help you down the road to gdpr compliance but there's no silver bullet or no technical solution to ensure solely that you are compliant um, to meet the GDPR requirements, you still have, as a, a data controller, uh, responsibility. And I, that's a typo there. It says collectors as data controller. You still have responsibilities uh, for controls and the handling of data and the instructions that you might be providing the processor uh, when it comes to um, GDPR compliance. Um, and, and one could argue that uh, at the end of the day, most of the responsibilities are uh, fall on the, the hands of the data controllers, which are the companies that are collecting the EU citizen personal data and then determine what they want to do with it from a, 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 a controller perspective, instructions, if you will, that the processors in some cases are, are then carrying out. But very, very important to understand this shared responsibility model, uh, not just for GDPR compliance, but for handling the data uh, in the cloud versus on-prem in general. All right, uh, two last slides here, and then we'll we'll get to questions. Um, still a lot of unknowns about GDPR, um, and we won't ha have answers to some of these questions till you know, probably not even May 25th. But once the first start of first set of audits starts happening uh, in the EU, we'll get a better idea. But uh, we don't know which companies are going to be chosen first to get audited for GDPR compliance come May 26, 2018. Um, Lots of folks have hunches out there. Well, uh, the EU and the, and the supervisor authorities conducting the audits in different countries go after the larger comp companies first. Uh, obviously, the fines are pretty hefty. Um, and from, from my understanding, and I've uh, not confirmed this uh, with the IAPP, but uh, uh, that, that governs the regulation, but everything I've read is a lot of these supervisor authorities in different, different countries that are performing the audits are funded by the fines that they collect. And if that indeed is true, then you have a model where uh, the more fines you hand out, the easier it is to support your organization from a funding perspective, a dollar perspective, and probably the more fines you collect, the more auditors you can hire, and the more audits you can conduct. So it'll be, it'll be interesting to see what the criteria is for first, what companies get audited. And then second, the definition of personal data. Uh, I, I, let me go back to that because I did have the one slide in there that uh, um, didn't see it was there, but when it talks to personal data and information, both direct and indirect, let me let me highlight that a little bit more. So things such as first name, last name, address, phone number, email, cell phone, um, 
that's pretty common information people understand, but the, but the regulation goes deeper into things such as political party, religion, biometric data. So let's say uh, you have a security system where someone has to scan their thumbprint or scan their hand, maybe scan their retinas to get into your building. That biometric data is governed by GDPR. Uh, that's some of the information that, again, um, uh, could tie you to, could, is identifiable to you and the EU data data citizen or EU citizen from a data subject perspective. Uh, information like license plates, registration type of information uh, is also information there. So there's a lot of personal data that goes deeper than the traditional PII I talked about uh, from, a, from a United States perspective that uh, we still wanna see though when the audits first start happening, exactly where they're drawing the line, what personal data is or isn't from an audit perspective. And, and that'll drive then a lot of activities for folks going forward, I think as well. Will there be some uh, strictly fines all the time or will there be some, some warnings first? I guess we'll find out on that as well. I personally think that there's just gonna be fines and, and probably not a lot of warnings, but, but you never know. And then there's still, the way the regulation is written, uh, it does not replace country specific uh, regulations that might be in place and already need to be enforced uh, in, in, in conjunction or in place of GDPR. So. Uh, some some countries in the EU have already had their own privacy regulations and enforcement groups in place for years. Uh, they've chosen not to replace those with GDPR, but just to have those still function in tandem with with GDPR. So it's going to be interesting to see how how that plays out as well. Certainly, I would think it makes sense at some point to maybe have some consolidation there from an enforcement perspective. But the way the regulation is written right now, it doesn't replace anything a given country in the in the EU might be doing related uh, to existing privacy regulations. And as I mentioned there, that last bullet, um, I fully expect, expect countries like the US and other countries to eventually come out with their own version of GDPR. Um, uh, certainly right now, uh, GDPR applies again to European citizens and the privacy of their personal data. I, I could see a similar regulation for here in the States and, and for countries in Asia, Asia Pacific, uh, Australia, you name it. I, I think you're going to see this start with GDPR in the EU, but it's going to grow and you'll see similar regulations around the globe probably in another year or two or three, depending on how long it takes governments to put them in place. Bottom line is they're all designed to protect that personal data that is owned by you. It's your personal data. You have rights to it from a privacy perspective. Companies need to respect those rights and need to put processes in place to ensure your data is, is secure and whatever direction uh, you want those companies to go with your data, you have the right to tell them what to do with it. So, but those are some unknowns that if we were to get together six months from now, uh, probably this, this list will look a bit different, but lots of us that are actively following GDPR are very, very uh, interested to see how some of these bullets uh, play out here uh, come May 25th. All righty, so I know that's a lot of information. I know I talk a lot, or talk fast, I should say. So. Uh, just a brief summary uh, for maybe those of you that joined us um, during the middle of the webinar, or perhaps those who are wanting to just tie everything back together here. Uh, here's a couple bullet points just to summary. First off, um, the deadline for GDPR compliance, May 25th of this year, May 25th, 2018. Uh, that deadline's not changing. Um, data processors and data, data, data controllers all have calls to action related to the handling of personal data. Uh, um, everyone has a role to play. Uh, it's just not all in the processors. It's just not all in the controllers. It's, it's related to both. Um, traditional controls that you may already have in place in your company, and perhaps they get audited, especially for, for larger enterprise companies that have their accounting firms auditing them all the time and have their internal auditors audit them all the time. A lot of those traditional controls uh, play a role with GDPR. Um, in collective evidence to having documentation, if you do get audited, related to your compliance activities, things such as performing access reviews, who has access to this EU citizen personal data, uh, are there right audit trails about who's accessing that data, data and what's happening with it? Have you effectively classified that data in your organization and what type of classifications are? And have those been reviewed for, from a GDPR perspective? All those controls uh, are, are key and provide evidence around a GDPR compliance. And then the last bullet there, as I mentioned at the beginning under myths and uh, misconceptions is that uh, GDPR applies to any company which happens to house or collect and maintain uh, 
personal data of EU citizens, uh, period. It does not matter if your company is based in the EU, has headquarters in the EU, has operations in the EU. Uh, that, is, that is not a requirement. It's the, the way the regulation is written is specific to EU citizens and their personal data, wherever that data may reside and the privacy and the rights to that data. So uh, make sure your, your company understands that, that uh, certainly for listening to this webinar uh, today and you're in the EU, I'm pretty sure you already know that, but for those of us that aren't in the EU, uh, it's still, GDPR still does apply to us if we have EU citizen data. So with that, I know that's a lot of information. And certainly, as I mentioned before, we could talk for days and days and days and uh, companies are out for workshops, week-long training plus and GDPR compliance. But let's open it up for questions here and, and see what the audience might might have to say, have to think. Uh, looks like we have about so, uh, 10 minutes or so before the top of the hour. So uh, if you do have a question, feel free to type into the questions queue inside go to webinar here, and I will, will answer your question. And if I can't answer your question today, I will follow up with you with an answer as well. Um, I'll share my email here out here in a second. So uh, let's see, it looks like uh, one of the questions that came in, uh, and this unfortunately is a common one, especially there's a lot of studies out there uh, from the big four county firms and the like that uh, a lot of companies are behind in, on GDPR compliance. The question is, um, it says, my company first started talking about GDPR just this year. Frank, this sounds like a whole lot of stuff to get done by May 25th. What happens if we're not done by then? And uh, that's a great question. It's a very common one. Um, as I briefly mentioned there on one of the last couple of slides, um, we don't know exactly who's going to get audited first. And when they do get audited exactly, uh, there's still some unknowns there with how the definition of personal data is actually strictly going to be enforced and what's in and what's out the list, if you will. Uh, I would say this, uh, speaking as an auditor myself, um, even if you're not done with, with your GDPR compliance project by May 25th, if you've started it and you're putting processes in place, you have a project plan and, 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 and a person that may not be familiar with GDPR but understands projects can look at it and say, these folks have a plan of attack. These are the steps that they're, used, they're following. This is how they're, they're, they're viewing GDPR. They're doing their assessment, looking for compliance gaps. They're doing remediation within addressing those gaps and they have a time frame to get to compliance. If your company would happen to get audited before you are actually done, in this scenario, let's say your project plan shows you you can't get done by May 25th, but you can be done by August 1st. If you get audited sometime bef between the end of May and August 1st, I would hope the auditors would look at that and say, hey, they were following the steps a little bit late in the game, but but they understand the importance of compliance. They understand how important it is to, to protect the EU citizen personal data and that you would get some relief either from a fines perspective or more importantly, just from an audit perspective. Um, uh, if, if you're not doing anything with it and there's there's evidence to show that you made a conscious decision to start late because you didn't buy into it, that might be different. But if you have a project plan in place and this from a timing and resources perspective, you can't get that plan done by May 25th, but you show evidence that you're working through the plan and you're trying to, to meet certain parts of the guidelines uh, by May 25th that you feel are higher risk or uh, more impacting than others. I, I think the auditors that might be look, would look at that and, and, and perhaps and this is again my opinion perhaps be a little bit more lenient than they would for a company that flat out just refuses to, to address gdpr or decide it's not that important from a business priority perspective so hopefully that answers that question uh, another question uh, that, that came in here uh, and it's about tools um, it says i see a lot of tools out there uh, that claim to help with gdpr compliance can you talk briefly about the tools out there for identifying personal data and is there one tool out there that you'd recommend over another? Um, great question. And I would tell you again, I mentioned um, a lot of the business software vendors, SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, NetSuite, uh, long list of them have, have put information out there about GDPR and, and uh, from a compliance perspective, what tools they have to help with compliance and where they stand as a company related to compliance. Um, I would say there's not one tool that that you can run against your systems that will identify all the personal data you might have for EU citizens. But I would encourage you to go out and look for whatever business software solution you use, go to their website first, see what tools they talk about they have themselves that can help with that exercise. I know like with SAP, uh, the IOM tool, I can help with that. 
Microsoft Dynamics re recently reached, released a people search tool that can help with, with identifying where that personal data might be. So I would encourage you first to go out and look at your <coughs> business software vendor and see if they have any tools they develop themselves to go out and, and help identify personal data uh, inside your systems so you can know what you have where and then build processes around uh, securing the privacy of that. Uh, but I will also tell you that a lot of companies have found that they can use their own IT resources, have a lot of smart developers that can develop similar tools as well. So there is not one tool out there uh, that, that is sort of the gold standard that companies are using. Uh, there's lots and lots of companies that are providing GDPR compliant services that have developed their own tool as well to work with different business software packages. So um, not one tool to rely on. The key is to find the tool that you're comfortable can identify the right data in your system. And part of that's evaluating tools. Part of that then is once you're running the tool to then do some testing to see if and indeed it did, did collect and identify all the personal data you were hoping it would. But, but that's a great question. All right, looks like we got one more question that's come through, and this is a good one as well. And one I struggle with, uh, and because I know it, it's something that uh, a lot of folks are asking about. Um, understand that the personal data and identifying where it exists in our existing systems makes sense, but what about personal data that might exist in backups or archives that we have done? What does the regulation say about that data when it comes to the right to be forgotten or um, the right of, of erasure? Basically, again, uh, reminding folks that if I determine I'm an EU citizen and I don't want you to store my personal data anymore, and I request that you, uh, I want to be forgotten, and you evaluate my request and determine that it's a valid one and there's not a need for me to continue to keep your data, I have to go and within 72 hours um, get rid of your data. Uh, Probably easier to identify where it's at in the production systems, but what about the test system backups and have you? Uh, trying to erase that data from backups and archives could be a, a much tougher exercise. And I know there's some companies out there that have tools to do that. Uh, the auditor in me says that, that hopefully uh, your company in their GDPR processes has built some, some statements and evaluated how you want to handle this and, and noting that perhaps your backups and your archives are secured in a way uh, that data is not normally available for use and that when you would have to restore backups that then you have a process in place to go out and before those backups are then deployed you have a process in place to go to anonymize or uh, uh, whatever procedure you've done for right to be forgotten you do that for any eu subjects that requested their data be forgotten um, i'm a little bit concerned of, of trying to run a tool that would go out in a, in the archival tools or recovery uh, backups and just start, uh, for lack of a better word, nuking some data out in the middle of uh, some data files. I think you run the risk perhaps of some data integrity issues if you ever need to pull that data up and restore it. So I think one solution, again, this is something that you'd have to uh, evaluate internally, but one solution might be that uh, instead of trying to remove it from all your backups is that you build in your procedure that if the backups ever have to be used, uh, as you're restoring them, before you make them available in production, you first then go out and uh, remove whatever data needs to be removed, just like you would have done it from your production systems uh, using the same tools or techniques you might have deployed. Um, again, it'll be interesting to see, again, how the auditors view that. Um, backups and archival, sometimes it's a lot tougher to get that data, especially in the cloud, where that data is, those bytes and bits are literally spread out all over the place. Um, a little bit easier to get to from an on-prem perspective and it's a backup perhaps that you've uh, then stored off-site. But uh, uh, good question. And again, it's gonna be interesting to see how the regulators and the auditors look at this uh, as well versus just focusing more on production systems. So with that, I do not see any more questions in the queue. I, I do want to share out my, my contact information, however, as I mentioned, if you do have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you see my email address there. I do certainly appreciate Everyone's time today. Uh, GDPR uh, is a complicated regulation. Um, it, it has lots and lots of uh, information in it that's very, very difficult sometimes to read through. But I, I would tell you, hopefully, if, if your company is starting down the path of compliance, that's, that's great to hear. If you're sort of new to the game and, and haven't started doing a whole lot with that, hopefully today's webinar provides some good background information that would help you start down that road to compliance. Um, 
similar to any project that you have that that's designed to help you meet regulations. Uh, it starts with first understanding the regulation, next then accessing where your company stands with that regulation, identifying the gaps, and then putting processes and the procedure in place to to meet those gaps. Um, GDPR is, is something that's not going away, and as I mentioned before, I fully expect uh, other countries besides just the EU countries to come up with their own version of it. So uh, any activities you take around GDPR probably are going to be able to be applied to uh, personal data of, of non-EU citizens at some point as well. And I would encourage your companies to consider that up front as you're modifying your existing procedures for GDPR compliance and look at maybe doing something similar uh, for all, all personal data you can co collect, whether it's EU citizen specific or not, because one uh, would put you in a better uh, spot if other regulations then do occur country by country because you've already designed uh, the security and privacy correctly. And two, um, it's it just from a corporate perspective, perhaps uh, the right way to to handle things. Uh, address everyone, uh, personal data the same, regardless of what country uh, you might reside in. So with that, we will wrap up today's webinar. Uh, again, this has been Frank Bukovic with FastPath. Any follow-up questions you might have around GDPR, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you see my email address there, uh, frank.vukovic at gofastpath.com. Thanks for your time today.